Hi, I'm Daz, and today on the bench is a Ross um, RTV5, which is a television and a radio all in one, and an alarm clock too. This was kindly donated to the channel by George Chriscoff, and uh, so we'll uh, have a quick look at it. I'm not sure of the age, um, but I think it's probably around the 1980s stage, um, just from the styling, etc. In the 80s, um, 1983 I think it was, the breakfast television broadcast started and uh, I think having a television and your alarm clock became quite popular then. So just looking at the unit, there's a loudspeaker in the top. There's your screen here which says it's a four and a half inch um, screen. It's black and white of course. You've got the tuning scale for FM and AM and also your UHF tuning scale which goes from channel 21 to 69 which is what we used to have when we had analogue television it's actually 10 years actually I've just realised since analogue television uh, closed down in my area so let's look around the side at some of the controls we've got we've got tuning control power auto off and on radio or television and a band select for AM FM we've been provided with volume and tone controls Looking round the back, we've got the ambiguous sort of two-pin connector that seem to be on most stuff in this age. There's also an external 12 to 15 volt input, so you could use this in a car. The aerial connector is a compact jack, and you just need to use an adapter. We've got controls for brightness, contrast, and vertical hold. Now, I was wondering how the clock was working, but I've just realised that under this carrying handle is a battery compartment, so that must be for the clock. Underneath there is, let's put it up the other way, is a large cavernous uh, battery compartment that takes 10 C cells. And I guess that's to give you plenty of headroom for the regulated supply, which I guess would probably be regulated to around 11 volts to 12 volts inside the set. So it certainly cost you a bit for um, batteries to run this, I guess. So, um, just looking at the clock, there is some black marks on the clock and sometimes LCDs from this age seem to exhibit this. It's possible that something has leaked or liquid's got in and it's damaged it, but the clock is, nevertheless, you can read the main times, just the seconds that are just slightly disguised there. I suppose, yeah, quite easy to set. Hours, minutes, mode. So... There's two modes there, not sure what, the, oh that's alarm, I see, alarm off on, and there's a sleep function as well, so you probably go to sleep watching the television or listening to the uh, radio. There's also a telescopic aerial, and that's quite monstrous, oh yes, that's quite a large aerial. So, anyway, let's uh, power it up and see what happens. Well, let's flip the power switch on. Oh yes, the radio's working on FM, very good. And let's flick it to AM. Oh, it gets Caroline, that's good. Right, so that's working. Now let's see what happens when I flick it to television. Okay. Okay. Oh, look at that, cool. Right, let's get a signal into this. Well, I've just made up a lead. It's a Fono to jack plug adapter, and this is a standard UK Balling Lee aerial connector. That's what we use in this country for uh, television uh, sockets on television receivers. So I'll get that plugged in. Well, let's have a little tune. I guess this is about channel 36, this uh, test generator of mine. Oh, there we go. Some test bars. This is from my uh, Orion test generator. Just... Nope, that must be vertical hold. <laughs> now, just try and get it so you can see all the bars. Yeah, that's not too bad. So there we go. It is working. Well, on my bench now are some other bits and bobs. This is called a uh, UHF modulator. And what that basically does is it takes a composite signal in or via a SCART connector and that modulates it onto the UHF band. So 
as long as you can get a composite signal, um, you can send a picture to the set. Um, this is the ambiguous SCART connector, um, popular in the days of the CRT. Um, it enables you to carry RGB stereo audio and also a return composite path as well. So uh, they were an easy one-stop solution to get uh, a reasonably good picture. They're also compatible with SVHS signals, you know, um, that's the um, separate YC. I was going to have a little play today because I got this device and uh, I was just wondering whether I could actually get it to work. Some leads, so I think I'll get the laptop out and see what I can do. Well that's a good start, I've plugged the modulator into the unit and I've got a stable signal and it says no signal on the screen which is probably hard to see. I'm using channel 37, this one has a digital readout which I can't actually see showing on the camera which is rather odd but there we go. So I guess plug my laptop in next. Well there we go, there's uh, windows on a black and white television. <laughs> Rearrange your displays. Okay so the cement the um, it's not fantastic. It's a bit over scanned, and the geometry is not brilliant. But uh, there we go. Identify one of two. Yeah, they're both set the same, aren't they? So there we go. <laughs> I don't know who that strange bloke is. <laughs> And there's the man himself. <laughs> and uh, audio seems to be being passed through as well. Well that's quite fun. I noticed when I plugged this adapter in that the laptop went to 4x3, which is interesting. Looks like Windows needs activating. Yes, yeah, so that's an interesting little toy. Obviously I remember to push it in the PAL position. I don't know what happens if you flick it. Yeah. So it is changing the frame rate because it's now rolling. So uh, yeah that's interesting. So yeah that's a useful device. I could see that being useful if you're still doing analog amateur television and you want to put some titles up perhaps from a uh, from your PC. Um, put a test card up or something so I can certainly see that as being useful. Now I'm having a nostalgia uh, sort of check out here. This is a 70 centimeters amateur television transmitter. This is a 1 megahertz filter. As you can see the picture isn't that bad um, considering it's been limited to, um, at 2 megahertz. It's cut off I think it's about 1.5 megahertz so that isn't a bad picture really if you consider. Um, I've got some other filters here as well. Um, this one's a 2 megahertz one. Okay it's a bit smeary, it's not perfect but it's not a bad picture really. and. Uh, this is where these come in useful. Most of them, if you tune right down to the bottom, will pick up 70 centimetres amateur television. Um, and if they don't, quite often there's a preset adjustment um, on the Vary ACK um, so that you can change the voltage going to that and get it a bit lower. But uh, I've got my spectrum analyzer turned on actually, so uh, we'll have a look at that. Well, there we go, there's the. Just hit it, that's better. I have to hit it occasionally. Um, 437, you can see it's about a megahertz each side, so that's not bad, is it? Um, and this is the first amateur television I did, uh, was using this uh, AM transmitter for 70 centimetres with the filters in. Because by then the bands were getting rather crowded and trying to put a colour signal on, I think you'd uh, have a very, very wide signal. Just change the resolution bandwidth and yeah you can see the video signal there on the edges there so and that's the carrier of course so if I disconnect the video there you go just a carrier and now you can see the video on the edges And there's what happens when you stick a colour signal in, 437383940, out the amateur band. That's the colour subcarrier at 4.43. One reason why it's not very advisable to uh, put a colour signal on. Of course, if you're on 435, I guess 
it would be a bit more within, but of course it's double sideband, so um, let's see if I can recenter this. Remember how to do it. Oh, there we go. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> very, very close. Three five, three six, three seven, three eight, three nine. Yes, so a colour signal's taken the entire seventy centimetres band, so there we go. That's uh, one reason why I don't. And that's what it looks like with the two megahertz filter stuck in. So that's uh, <laughs> certainly taken the edge off that. Just a shot inside the uh, one megahertz filter. Do you know I can't even remember building this, but I must have done. It's uh, got a couple of uh, inductors in it, and uh, that's quite a few capacitors. Don't know if I've still got the circuit for it, but. Uh, this is inside the 2 megahertz filter. Do you know what, I just I barely can remember, I can't even remember making these, but I must have done. <laughs> I'm still trying to think about how I made these. I've got a feeling it may have been a BATC article or one of their books that I got this information about these filters. I'm not sure now. It's such a long time ago. But I was able to at the time to use my ask if I could use the works network analyzer and that's how I set them up. Got a success with the still, so he's gonna put it in video mode. Um because what you want is a little VCR or something. Tim the wave. Um Tim the wave. enjoy with the video. Tim the wave. Give it to wave. So there is something okay, on. No Tell him I'm recording it. Well, I hope you found that interesting. <laughs> what uses you can use for an old little black and white television. So, uh, certainly we came up with a few things there, didn't we? But it uh, takes me back to my days of uh, analogue uh, amateur television. Um, much more fun than having to muck around with computers and trying to get bit rates right. And what have you but uh, it was a bit of fun I only ever used it I think once and uh, got managed to get a couple of miles um, with it using beams so uh, there we go so uh, that's my first foray into amateur television with my uh, amateur radio license of course you uh, need a license to transmit of course in this country anyway thanks for watching I hope you found that interesting and uh, I'll see you soon